Well, welcome everyone to Preservation Virginia's virtual legislative reception. I'm Elizabeth Castelny, and I want to thank you all for joining this evening and especially want to greet um, some of our elected officials, Senator Evans and Suraville and members of the House of Delegates, Carr, Keem, Rasul and Shen um, for their attendance tonight. Our thanks also goes to our sponsors, Rick Barker Properties, Monument Construction, Historic Lit Richmond, Linden Capital, National Trust Insurance Services, Glave and Homes, Piedmont Environmental Council, Herschler, Commonwealth Preservation Group, and Jenny Keller and Trip Pollard, who are also um, two of our speakers tonight. Um, this support is instrumental not only in making this educational, pos educational program possible, but it also supports our advocacy efforts at the General Assembly and throughout the year. I also wanna remind you that on March 9th, we'll begin an educational web series, Preservation Academy. It's a collaboration with Preservation Virginia and the Virginia Department of Historic Resources, a four-part series over five weeks that will bring experts in the field so please check our website for more information. So to introduce our guests tonight and tonight's program, it's my pleasure to welcome Genevieve Keller, Preservation Virginia's board chair. Jenny is a nationally known leader in cultural landscape and historic preservation practice and theory. She has brought that expertise and wisdom to our work at Preservation Virginia by serving in various capacities over a number of years and offering us guidance over the last two decades. Never has her leadership been more appreciated than over the last two and a half years, as Preservation Virginia navigated the uncertainty and emerged with a revised strategic vision and a strengthened statewide program. Jenny? Thank you, Elizabeth. And thanks to the rest of our remarkable staff who plan and carry out events like this one on behalf of Virginia's historic places. It's my privilege tonight to bring you greetings from Preservation Virginia's Board of Trustees and to welcome all preservation supporters, partners, and allies from across the Commonwealth. And tonight, because of this program, we extend a very special welcome to all elected and appointed state and local officials and their staffs who are in attendance, because we recognize the importance of private public partnerships and mutual support in preserving valued places in Virginia. Also on our screen, we're pleased tonight to be here with Will Glasgow, our development director, and Julie Langen, director of the Virginia Department of Historic Resources. Director Langen will make brief remarks later in the program. Please note that also on the panel are Trip Pollard, senior attorney and leader of Southern Environmental Law Center's Land and Community Program. Uh, we're also very fortunate to have Trip as our vice chair, and he serves on the Historic Resources Board. Uh, later, we will be joined by our legislative counsel, Hunter Jamerson of Macaulay, Jamerson, and Sessa. And both Tripp and Hunter will be speaking later in the program. But our featured speaker tonight is Donovan Ripkema, principal of Place Economics, a Washington, D.C. based real estate and economic development consulting firm. Donovan has worked in 49 states and more than 30 countries. And without question, he is the leader in preservation economics. And he knows Virginia well, having conducted the first ever analysis of that type of work right here in the Commonwealth for our organization. That work has served us well over the years and has helped to make Virginia a leader in the kinds of historic building rehabilitations that help revitalize communities, provide jobs, and generate state and local revenues. Donovan's work is both practical and inspirational, and I'm sure that you will find his remarks relevant to your own Virginia communities. So tonight, I'm very pleased to introduce you to Donovan Ripkema. Donovan. Thanks, Jenny, for the, for the introduction. And thanks, Elizabeth, for inviting me to participate in this legislative reception. Uh, Preservation Virginia, as I know, all of you know, is one of the great statewide preservation organizations in the country. So I'm, I'm happy and I'm very honored to be uh, to invited uh, to join you. So my, my job tonight is to, uh, oh, next please. Uh, my job tonight is to talk about the economics of uh, historic preservation. And I'm gonna do that in kind of five 
uh, different ways to look at the role of historic preservation as job generator, uh, to look at historic preservation as tourism generator, uh, to look at the role that historic preservation often plays as a catalyst to additional investment, uh, historic preservation and the triple bottom line, and finally some new data about the status of historic trades in Virginia. Next. But much of the factoids that you'll hear are from a dozen or so city level studies that we've done in the last uh, few years, including large cities like New York and Los Angeles and Phoenix and San Antonio, some mid-sized cities like Pittsburgh and Indianapolis, Raleigh, Nashville, Miami, and then some smaller places like Cumberland, Maryland and Saratoga Springs, New York and, and uh, Savannah, Georgia. Uh, next, please. So uh, for those of you who are who are uh, uh, have math anxiety or hate looking at charts, tables and numbers, uh, this is going to be a painful exercise. But the good news is it won't be that long. So uh, maybe you can uh, last through it. Next, please. So this first issue about uh, historic preservation as a job creator, historic preservation really is uh, economic development tool. Next, please. As a as a kind of rule of thumb. Uh, in new construction in the United States, when money is spent, about half of that money will go for labor, half of that for materials. Next. But on rehabilitation of the total expenditure, 60 to 70 percent will go to labor with the balance being materials. And this creates what's known as labor intensity, and that has huge impacts on a local economy. Next. So in the in the U.S., Every time 100 jobs are created in new construction, that creates an additional 135 jobs somewhere else in the economy, so that's great. But every time we create 100 jobs in rehabilitation, that creates 186 jobs elsewhere in the economy. And if you convert that to, to incomes, uh, in the US, every $100 of labor income and in new construction creates another $145 in labor income elsewhere in the economy. But that $100 in labor, labor income and rehabilitation creates $174 in labor income elsewhere. And this, again, is that revolving effect of labor intensity at the local level. Next. But it's just not the construction uh, jobs that are a job creating aspect of historic preservation. We looked uh, at Los Angeles in a study we released a couple of years ago at where the job growth was in the city. Well, the city over the, the 10 year period we looked, the city of Los Angeles had about a 15 percent job growth. But in their local historic districts, what they call historic preservation overlay zones, uh, the job growth there was 25 percent. In the National Register District, it was almost 55 percent. So decidedly greater than the job growth in the city as a whole, meaning reflecting, in fact, this uh, inclination of businesses and the jobs that follow them are to locate in historic buildings and historic neighborhoods. Next. Uh, Nashville, one of the big booming cities in America. Uh, they have uh, lots of historic districts, most of them residential, but they do have uh, some commercial historic districts uh, that include 3% of all of the jobs in Nashville. But 11% of the job growth, 13% of the startup jobs, and 15% of small business jobs are, in fact, in those historic commercial neighborhoods in Nashville. Next. Uh, and then New York City and the creative class jobs. You can love New York, you can hate New York, but nobody can say it's not one of the most creative cities in the world. So we've looked at where those jobs in the creative class categories are located. Well, in Manhattan, about 12 and a half percent of all the jobs are in historic districts, but almost a quarter of the jobs in the uh, arts, entertainment, uh, recreation, those creative class jobs are in those uh, historic neighborhoods. But it's not true of just Manhattan. If you look at all five boroughs, similar numbers, all uh, historic districts in all five boroughs include about eight and a half percent of all the jobs in New York, but almost 20 percent of those creative class jobs. This choice of businesses who employ those creative class workers of being in historic districts. Next. So the next one, one that, of course, you have great resources in, uh, in Virginia, and that is uh, for uh, attracting heritage-based uh, tourists. Next, please. Uh, a few years ago, I read a study that was done in Norway, uh, and it 
it concluded that when a heritage visitor goes to an historic site, in fact, only a, between six and 10% of the money that that visitor spent, in fact, ended up at the historic site. The rest of it went someplace else. So I was very curious about if that pattern would be true in the US as well. So in a study we did a, a few years ago in Utah, next please, uh, we looked at that same measurement and the number was virtually the same that in Utah, and Utah is a big state geographically, a couple of larger cities, but mostly small towns, widely separated, but many of which have an historic site that's the magnet for visitation. People go to those towns to visit that historic site in those towns, but those historic sites in Utah, get 7% of the tourism dollars. All that other 93% is spent somewhere else. Well, where is that somewhere else? Next. Well, uh, $186 million in, in hotels, uh, uh, $115 million in restaurants, $242 million in transportation, $53 million in retail, $53 million in groceries, and $54 million in entertainment. And it's in that entertainment category where things like admissions to historic sites are included. So that, that historic site might have been brought them to the town. But it was the grocery store, the hotel, the restaurant, the gas station, in fact, that were by far the biggest beneficiaries of that heritage visitor. Next. Then this, this increasing role and consistency in all different kinds of markets of the role of historic preservation projects as catalysts for additional activity. Next. Uh, when we did a study in Pittsburgh, one of the great urban comeback stories in America. Uh, we interviewed Jared, uh, Jeremy Waldrum, the downtown uh, a director of the downtown organization, said what's behind the, the growth and revitalization of downtown. He said historic preservation has been the key to downtown's growth. Next. Uh, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. The kind of main street of Baton Rouge is called uh, is Third Street. And for decades, it was a pretty boring place, not much activity after the nine to five realm. Until on a small scale, developers started acquiring buildings, small buildings, rehabilitating them using the federal and the Louisiana state tax credits. And all of a sudden things changed a lot growing uh, from uh, one or two projects to multiple projects. Now uh, third street is a hot, vibrant uh, 24 hour a day street in Baton Rouge, vastly different. Uh, than uh, a decade ago. And the, the reason for it is the rehabilitation of the historic buildings along Third Street. Next. Uh, one of my favorite stories, any place, uh, is in inner city Baltimore. It was an industrial building that was converted into a housing. Uh, and so we looked at what happened around within 500 feet of Miller's Court. Well, there had been virtually no activity until Miller's Court you know, took, got put online, and then people were acquiring, investing, and building all around there. Uh, Baltimore, which uh, over the 13-year period we looked at, was still lost population, but the area around Miller's Court, in fact, grew in population. This role of historic preservation as a catalyst. Next. Uh, all of you know about the Savannah College of Art and Design, and SCAD basically uses the city as their campus. And SCAD acquires every white elephant building that nobody wants. Uh, empty schoolhouse, uh, a jail, an armory, whatever the buildings that are kind of nobody can figure out what to do with. Uh, SCAD acquires them and figures out what to do with them and uh, uh, invest in those around the town. So we looked at what happened around those SCAD buildings. Uh, subsequent to their making that catalytic investment. Well, what happened is in every instance, regardless of the time frame, the values within 500 feet of those SCAD projects, in fact, increased in value at a rate greater than the city as a whole. Next. In Baltimore, again, uh, we took a, we did a study of their city level uh, property tax credit program, very successful 35 year old program. Uh, and we looked at the change in value of the properties that use the credit, but also at properties within 500 and 1000 feet of those tax credit projects. And you can see in the graph, well, of course, the blue line is the tax credit projects. And of course, they would go up in value, people have reinvested money in them. But the properties within 500 feet, 
and the properties within a thousand feet of those tax credit projects also saw rates of value increase decidedly greater than the value increase in the rest of Baltimore. Next. Uh, and then maybe my, my favorite example of all times is Rouse's Market in New Orleans. Here's a 1950s uh, automobile dealership uh, that got put on the National Register. And this was not one of the really kind of cool tourism driven parts of New Orleans. This is kind of a neighborhood and there was lots of vacant land around Rouse's Market. Well, it was redeveloped, but you can see what happened between Katrina in 2004 and Rouse's Market. Virtually nothing happened in this neighborhood. Nothing, nothing happened. And then Rouse's Market took place, followed by $140 million worth of investment. And we talked to the developers of those buildings, most of the new buildings, most of them constructed on lots that were already vacant and said, why did you, why did you invest in this, this much money in this neighborhood? And they, to a person, said because of Rouse's market. But Rouse's market happened because of historic tax credits and uh, both on the federal and state level as an historic building. Next. Then this, this issue that's getting more inter. Uh, uh, attention internationally. And that's the things maybe ought to be measured on the triple bottom line basis. That means uh, economic side, but also social environmental side. Well, the city of Calgary in Canada uh, has four commercial districts that have a concentration of uh, heritage buildings. And they said, we want to know the value of those commercial districts, and but we want to know it on the economic side, but also on the social and the environmental side. Next. And so we did that. So these buildings, these heritage buildings in the these four uh, commercial neighborhoods had a, a value, a base market value of about $400 million. But the market value of those buildings was an additional 40 uh, 4 million because of their status as heritage buildings that the marketplace recognized and rewarded them for that. And then there was another 275 million worth of, of buildings in these districts that were not heritage buildings with a base value of about 274 million, but they in the marketplace were worth an additional 53 uh, million or so because of their proximity to heritage buildings. There was another 80 million in social value and over 30 million in environmental value. So this concentration of heritage buildings with a base economic value of 400 million, in fact, ended up with these districts being worth uh, 900 million. It's this triple bottom line that often heritage buildings provide. Next. Then finally, I want to talk a, a bit about the heritage trades in Virginia. Uh, next. We are in the midst of an assignment for an organization called the Campaign for Historic Trades, who are trying to figure out what the status of the trades are, uh, if there's need for training, what the problems are, the shortages, surpluses. And our role in this, uh, among other things, was to do a very large national survey of people who know this stuff. Uh, well, uh, this is the first time this data has been released. The report's not even done, but the client said, go ahead and tell the people in Virginia. So out of this large uh, national sample, I pulled out the Virginia responses to the questions, and I want to share with you uh, some of those results. Next one. So first of all, who are these people? Uh, well, in fact, they are not just some casual observer. These are people who work in preservation that uh, 40 percent of them, in fact, spend most more than 80 percent of their work time on historic preservation uh, activities. Uh, and another uh, 10 percent spend between 60 and 80 percent of their time on historic preservation. So this is a, a, a knowledgeable activist preservation organization in their professional life. So competent to answer these questions. Next one. Uh, and one of the questions we had was, What's the shortage of qualified workers? And we had about 10 categories of uh, preservation trades. The purple at the top is severe shortage. The green right below that is shortage. Uh, uh, and so we asked the question, uh, are, is, there, is the workers in this area, is there a surplus of them? Is there an adequate supply? Is there a shortage? Is there a severe shortage? in every one of these categories. In fact, there were shortages and severe shortages with more than uh, half the respondents across the board. Next. Uh, and then what we asked, again, these knowledgeable people, well, what does it mean? 
when you have uh, experienced uh, preservation workers? Well, the top answer is that the work quality is increased and then fewer mistakes that have to be redone. And then the completed work will last longer and the time is saved. All of these positive benefits, how many people said that, well, it doesn't make any difference if they're experienced or not? Zero answered that that way. Next one. Uh, and then we asked about, about the training in the trades. What happens if you have training? Well, at the top of the list was it increases the quality of the work that's done. Uh, it increases options for property owners to find people to do the work. Uh, it provides pathways to people to find secure employment. So this is a really non-ideological kind of issue. Your primary cause might be, I want to make sure that people have good jobs. Your, your issue might be, I want historic preservation to be done right. Your issue might be, well, I want the marketplace to be adequately supplied with the workers that they need. If I'm a building owner, I don't care what your position is. This heritage training, I, in fact, would advance all of those. Next. So I want to finish with a quotation from one of the great American uh, uh, economist John Kenneth Galbraith, and he wrote, the preservation movement has one great curiosity. There is never retrospective controversy or regret. Preservationists are the only people in the world who are invariably confirmed in their wisdom after the fact. Next one, please. Thank you all very much for being here, and I look forward to the question and answer. Thank you, Donovan. And thanks for sharing your new research and data on historic building trades and their impact on the economy. All of this is so important in our economic recovery post pandemic and in returning historic buildings to active uses as places to live and work. But now we're going to focus exclusively on Virginia and I'm going to turn to the Department of Historic Resources Director, Julie Landon, who will elaborate on how these tools and techniques are part of DHR's program and ensuring that historic resources are continue to be a vital part of revitalizing Virginia's economy in communities all over the Commonwealth. Julie. Great. Thank you, Jenny. And thank you, Will, um, for showing my slides for me this evening. Before I launch into those, I'd just like to comment on a point that Donovan concluded with, and that was his focus on historic trades. This is a known critical need here in Virginia, and we all need to put our heads together and figure out a way to approach workforce development so that we do have people coming up in the trades uh, eager to work on historic buildings. From a personal perspective, I can say I've been waiting a year for a mason to come and work at my house. And for all I know, I'll be waiting another year. So Donovan, thanks so much for highlighting that need here, not, not just in the entire country, but here in Virginia. So over the next few minutes, I'm going to very briefly provide a snapshot of the economic impact of historic preservation on the economy of the Commonwealth of Virginia. And if we could go to the next slide, uh, for very good reason, the first program that comes to mind when thinking about how historic preservation efforts impact our economy, it's the tax credit program. And this is especially true in Virginia where we have what is arguably the best tax credit program in the country. And it's used with great frequency in tandem with the federal tax credit. And I think this slide speaks volumes. You can see the tax credit activity prior to the inception of a state credit. We were using the federal credit from 77 to 96. We were probably one of the country's biggest users of the federal credit. But look at what happened after 1997 when we had a 25% state tax credit. That's when things really started to take off. Many of us expected that COVID would significantly impact the use of tax credits. And I'm sure many of you on, on this um, Zoom meeting know that that in fact is not, that has not been our experience at all. Uh, we have been holding steady on the uses of tax credits here in the Commonwealth. So if we move on to the next slide, um, I just wanna do a bit of bragging for a minute. Uh, usually 
Virginia is one of the top users of the federal credits. We've maintained that position ever since um, we can remember and people have been keeping track. And for the year 2020, which is the most recent year for which there is a report, we um, were number one in the nation for approved part threes. So that means projects that were actually completed, um, got, got over the finish line. And um, more significantly, our cumulative totals for tax credits between 2016 and 2018 show Virginia ranking number two nationally for part three applications. And that number translates to one and a half billion in qualifying rehabilitation expenses, placing us at number six nationally. And you might say, well, gee, number six isn't number one, but keep in mind, we are competing with states that have much larger metropolitan areas. So we are definitely um, doing very, very well. And of course, Virginia State Program boosts participation in the federal tax credit program. Cumulatively, the figures represent reinvestment in Virginia's historic properties, resulting in millions of dollars in economic output, thousands of jobs, and supporting entrepreneurial and business ventures in communities throughout Virginia. With this next slide, I wanna just give a couple of examples of recently approved and completed projects. Small projects such as this gas station conversion in Gretna act as a catalyst for commercial development. And we've all, we've all seen that domino effect that takes place in small communities as well as large urban areas. The next project I'd like to show you in this next slide uh, is a much larger project and it's the Sessions Hotel in the city of Bristol. And with the permission of the developer, I'm actually gonna share with you some financials. Normally we don't share those with the public but I do in this case have permission to, to, to share some numbers. So in urban centers, such as Bristol, the impact can be even greater. And in this case, the Session Hotel works hand in hand with attracting tourists to the area. This project started out with a property that originally consisted of 11 different parcels, that included three historic buildings and four non-contributing buildings, and it was purchased for $1.1 million. The total project costs were 23.8 million with qualifying expenses of 21.8 million, 21 million. And the story doesn't end there. The impact on the local economy as an employer um, as well as from the perspective of real estate taxes paid is huge. For example, the pre-project as is assessment was 1.4 million. At completion, the local assessment was 10.5 million and the appraisal was 18.2 million. This project is now paying $88,000 a year in property taxes and paid just this last year, $620,000 in sales tax. Next slide. Recently begun, the iconic Homestead Resort, the largest employer in the area, will single-handedly shore up the economy of Bath County. Were you to ask the Omni Hotels, which I have, would they have taken on this investment if they weren't eligible for tax credits? And the answer is no. They are going to invest, they hope, not more than $100 million. And they project that their qualifying rehab expenses will be in the neighborhood of 64 million. Next slide. And of course, historic preservation has an enormously positive impact on tourism which in Virginia is a key component of our economy. 
Heritage tourism represents a significant but not recently studied component of this important industry. But we do have information through the Virginia Tourism Corporation, and we know that visitors who are interested in historic sites spend more, stay longer, and are uh, the kinds of people that we really want to attract um, to come and, and, and visit us. Uh, many of us, like all of us, I think, probably on this call, uh, consider ourselves history lovers. And when we travel, we seek out hotels such as the Sessions Hotel in Bristol. We like to visit restaurants that are in historic districts or in rehabbed historic buildings. We visit museums and historic sites and we might deviate a little and visit a brewery, a winery and do a bit of shopping. And last but not least, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that um, historic preservation. Um, oh, and I just wanted to show you some of these averages that um, the Virginia Tourism Corporation has been compiling from visitor surveys. So um, if we move on to the last slide, I'd just like to say that historic preservation also brings in a considerable amount of federal grant money to the state. We're actually very successful in applying for and receiving grant funds uh, through various programs. And I've listed just a couple of them on this slide. Uh, almost $7 million uh, has, we are in the process of spending here in Virginia as the result of hurricanes, Michael and Florence. So we are really only limited by our capacity to apply for grants and manage them. Um, and, and our preservation efforts do bring a lot of federal funding into the state. So thank you uh, very, very much. Uh, my last slide is just my contact information. I'll also put that in chat. We're going to have time for questions at the end. And if we don't get to yours, I would encourage you to reach out to me and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. So thanks very much. Thank you, Julie. We appreciate your comments this evening and we appreciate your leadership at the Virginia Department of Historic Resources all year long. Um, Virginia could have no greater partner than you and the departments staff and our colleagues over there. So thank you for sharing this impact um, assessment and for the work that you do. Um, we're now gonna turn our attention to the General Assembly session that is up and running here in Richmond. As Jenny mentioned, Preservation Virginia is fortunate to have the guidance and counsel of two incredible people, Tripp Pollard and Hunter Jamerson. Um, they advise us year round, but during the General Assembly session, um, they're hard at work keeping us, keeping their finger on the pulse of what's happening up um, here in Richmond. So Tripp and Hunter. Thank you, Elizabeth. And um, wanted to also thank everyone for joining reception this evening. And thanks to both Donovan and Julie for the excellent information showing and demonstrating very clearly the many, many benefits of historic preservation. Um, as Elizabeth mentioned, uh, we'll uh, shift gears a bit here now and, and talk, talk some about the current General Assembly session. So um, this session, we've had a very eventful session already with a lot more in store for us. Uh, over 2,100 bills have been filed and hundreds of resolutions. Um, and the committees and subcommittees have been in high gear this week because we're fast approaching the halfway point session and what's known as crossover day. And that's when bills have to get out of their house of origin to continue to be heard. There are also hundreds of budget amendments that have been filed and the budget process is beginning to ramp up as well. Um, Preservation Virginia is keeping an eye on a number of topics. Uh, as those of you who have signed up for our weekly alerts already know, um, we're also working to support other groups on a number of issues and important bills 
uh, such as land conservation. And then there are some bills and issues where we are playing a larger role. And I'd like to turn it now over to Hunter Jamerson um, to briefly talk about some of those items and where they are at this point in the session. Well, good. Thanks, Tripp. Uh, good evening, folks. Uh, good to be with you. And um, we'll focus now on the slide itemizing some of the legislative items that we're actively working on, so much so that I'm exiting a dinner with Senator Marsden, having worked on some of these items. So, uh, I've been happy to highlight a few of them this evening. Um, one of the most important that we're working on um, this session are the, uh, the BIPOC fund uh, bills and um, Delegate McQuinn, Dolores McQuinn and uh, Senator uh, uh, Hashmi are carrying these items and um, they're particularly important because they establish uh, the Virginia Black, Indigenous and People of Color Historic Preservation Fund. And the purpose here is to award grants to eligible state recognized and federally recognized Indian tribes, nonprofits and localities um, to assist with eligible costs for acquiring land or permanent protective interest um, and to undertake preservation activities um, on, on this land that would be of cultural historic significance to these communities. And, and one of the other important features that I know um, uh, Director Langen is, is very interested in is that the bill would provide um, land or interest acquired with these grant funds um, would be granted um, a perpetual preservation interest uh, to the Board of Historic Resources in those properties. So both of these bills are advancing um, in, the, in the Senate. We've passed on a 30 to 10 vote, we'll cross over to the House. Uh, the House is working through um, the, um, uh, the committee process now, um, and we will um, con continue to work and uh, support these bills as they uh, pass through. Uh, another bill, obviously, um, Donovan has uh, done an excellent job defining um, the, the importance. Um, uh, Delegate Alfonso Lopez has um, a historic tax credit, rehabilitation tax credit bill, and unfortunately failed on a party line vote. I'll spend just a second talking about that, but this would have doubled the um, total tax uh, uh, credit that could have been awarded in any tax year from five to 10 million. Um, I note that it failed on a party line vote, which is distressing, and I think a a call that um, Trip will spend a minute on our last slide talking about, but we, we have a significantly different General Assembly, particularly House of Delegates, and a significantly different makeup than we've had in years past. We have a substantial educational uh, uh, deficit that, that we need to uh, overcome that delta. Um, so there's, there's a lot of work to be done for everybody on this call to really highlight the importance of that historic rehabilitation tax credit. So I will um, continue through the slides here, um, a, a number of uh, bills here dealing with um, uh, the uh, tribal issues. We've got a tribal outreach position um, at uh, the Department of Historic Rehab, uh, Historic Resources and House Bill 1266. Additionally, Senate Bill 482 uh, deals with tribal consultation on state permitting. Uh, I'd like to highlight several of these African-American cemetery bills um, you see there's, um, there's six of them that preservation is, is uh, Virginia is working through. That They have a couple of purposes. Uh, one of them extends through 1948 eligibility for historic African-American cemeteries to better recognize the totality of segregated cemeteries in the state. Um, others would designate localities and other entities that could be eligible for uh, grant funds to um, administer and preserve um, and repair these cemeteries. Um, so these are important bills that are each making their way um, through the legislative process. The final bill I'll highlight, um, and, and Preservation Virginia has uh, highlighted the Green Book um, as one of its most endangered um, considerations recently. And, and we're very pleased that Delegate Mullen has brought a bill, uh, House Bill 508, um, whose purpose is um, to ensure that um, the, the Department of um, Historic Resources can recognize across the state and, and so designate historic sites that were in the Green Book. And I'm, I'm sure many on the call are well familiar, but the Green Book um, refers to the Negro Motorist Green Book, um, which was published by Victor Hugo Green and identified uh, hotels, guest houses, service stations, drugstores, taverns, barbershops, and restaurants 
which were known to be safe for traveling Black Americans during the Jim Crow era, and it empowers the department to develop a program to identify, publicize, and educate the public about locations in the Commonwealth, which are featured in the Green Book. Um, again, this bill is uh, moving forward in the, um, in the committee process, uh, and we're excited to see it cross over and support it in the Senate. Um, finally, Trent tr mentioned we're working on a number of budget amendment priorities, well, one of which specifically references Preservation of Virginia um, and, and its funding. But um, we're, um, uh, we have, uh, those of you who signed up for the legislative alerts, we'll talk about those in a second. Um, we're probably tracking 50 amendments at this point. Um, many of them are very much priority amendments. Some are specific to individual sites. Um, Preservation of Virginia will be uh, advocating for each of these in, in coalition with a number of preservation partners, as well as um, issues to, not immediately uh, on historic preservation, but of great interest to our community as well, including land preservation. Um, so we, we look forward to updating you through that uh, budget development process as chamber budgets report here on the 20th of February. So I will yield to trip to talk more about how we hope you will stay involved in this process. Thanks, Hunter. And uh, next slide. So um, as you can see, that's just a quick overview of some of the work uh, Preservation Virginia is doing in the General Assembly this session. It's another busy session. Um, and as you heard, we're making progress on some key bills uh, with more to come. So I would encourage all of you to please sign up for Preservation Virginia's legislative alerts if you haven't already. Um, and you can find additional information on our website about a number of other bills that uh, we don't have space to go into detail about in every, every one of our, our updates. Um, and I'd also encourage you to engage with your legislator, uh, as Hunter mentioned in connection with the historic rehab tax credit, and it applies to all, all preservation issues really, but you know, there's a constant need for education um, of legislators and their aides, and it's, it's just especially important that they hear from their constituents. They are dealing with a tremendous volume of bills every session, and it's just incredibly helpful for them to hear stories uh, from their constituents and hear why um, preservation matters. And if you do contact, um, uh, your legislator, please let President Virginia know and, and if you hear back and if you take action. And um, also just thank you for supporting President Virginia's policy work. And with that, um, stay tuned for the rest of the session. We will uh, be filling you in through those updates and um, we'll turn back over to Elizabeth. Thank you, Tripp and Hunter. Um, it's really hard to express our appreciation, but also to share with everybody that's um, tuning in the hard work that takes place during the session and how much you, time both of you devote to us. So we appreciate it. Um, now is the time for question and answers. And so um, I think the first one probably um, I'll ask Donovan to respond. Um, the question came in that said, with rising values of neighborhood properties can be good, but in poor and rural areas, neighbors may object to increased property assessments due to higher taxes they have to pay. How can rehabilitation occur but not adversely impact the neighbor's taxes? Well, it is a great question, a very legitimate one. What's very interesting in the 6,000 years that I've been involved in this stuff, uh, it, it used to be that the complaint about local designation was, hey, if you make this an historic district, it's one more hoop that I'm going to have to go for through. And that means prima facie, my property value is going to go down. Uh, and now when virtually every study anybody's made says, no, it's in fact the other way. Now the argument, oh, no, don't give me a stupid historic district because it means my property values are going to go up. Ergo, my property taxes are going up. I don't want to dismiss it as a legitimate issue. It is, but I just want to start out by noting this. I don't know the, the rates in every, every Virginia town and city, but across the country, effective property tax rates are someplace between one and a half and two and a half percent. So forget assessed value, mill levy, blah, blah, blah. Your house is worth $100,000. The taxes are going to be something between $1,500 and 
And it's just, it's going to be in that way. So let's, let's, let's have a, let's pretend. Let's pretend that you had a house in some rural Virginia city that went up from $100,000 to $110,000. So your assets have gone up $10,000. Your property taxes have gone up $150 or $250. So, so uh, uh, it doesn't make any difference. Yes, you have a higher property tax back, but your value, your asset has gone up 50 times what the property tax is. Now, that doesn't mean that that extra $150 or $250 doesn't create a strain on some people. I don't want to dismiss it. But the fact is, what we have is a cash flow problem, not a wealth problem, and that we're wealthier. We have significantly more asset value. It's just I'm trying to survive on my $800 a month Social Security check, and that extra $250 is a strain. There is a remedy for that. There is a remedy for that, and I don't know what the enabling legislation in Virginia would be like. But in fact, we ought to look at ways. We don't want people to be run out of their house because of increasing property taxes. Uh, so we ought to look at, at tools that say, Okay, you're in a position where that increase, your property value is going up, but that increase in property tax is causing a strain. So let's, the school district, the county, the city, the beneficiaries of property taxes, uh, let's just say, here's what we'll do. We'll just wait. We'll wait until you sell we'll, or till your kids inherit it or till you die. And then something else happens. Uh, and, it, and then we can collect those, those taxes in arrears but the value of the property is going up. And so that owner of that property, in fact, is decidedly better off. It's just that there could be a strain in the, in the property tax this year's taxes. So we ought to look for, for a tools uh, to address that. In some of the, in having said all that, because it is a concern in many places, both in rural, but also lots of urban areas that, yeah, okay, we're convinced you create an historic district and you're gonna see rates of property value increase greater than the city as a whole. So we've recommended to, to cities that when you create a new local historic district, you ought to simultaneously identify it as an affordable housing district. And we don't know exactly what that means, except that whatever tools there are to address housing affordability then ought to be concentrated in that, in that area uh, so that you're not running out people because of this mostly property, property tax uh, issue. Uh, so I think there needs to be more creative solutions. But property values going up in spite of property taxes going up is still 50 times better uh, than property, tax, property values and taxes going down. Great, thank you so much. Um, Julie, this one's probably for you and me, but there's the question about what is uh, DHR and or Preservation Virginia doing to support historic trades and the development of historic trades? Well, at, at present, um, I wish I could say we were doing more, but um, unlike Preservation Virginia, which I know um, is doing more and you'll speak to that, but I have been in conversation with a couple of um, other organizations who are looking at ways in which training programs can be developed and maybe uh, we can get some state support for some workforce um, development. And it's sorely needed. We just do not have nearly the number of qualified tradesmen that we need, and it seems to be an area that isn't necessarily attracting the, the younger uh, audience. So I'm completely committed to trying to find solutions to this problem. As I said, I'm personally feeling <laughs> um, the shortage, and I know because I answer the phone all day long, lots of other people are as well. Yeah. And at Preservation Virginia, we just received a grant that's going to allow us to hire two additional um, apprentice craftsmen that will study under our two-person team um, to start to develop, a, in our own small way, a pipeline for the trades um, um, with an idea of also diversifying the field. And so we're looking for younger people, we're looking for people of color, people that we can bring in, teach these trades, and then they can go out and um, work in different areas of the, the Commonwealth. So stay tuned, um, that will be coming soon. Um, let's see, 
Trip, um, you mentioned that we appreciate people connecting with their legislators. Do you have some tips, especially given um, that not as many of us are coming to Richmond and getting in the Pocahontas building? <laughs> sure, and um, honor feel free to chime in as well if you're, if you're still there. But um, you know, it, it, it's obviously if you happen to um, know your delegate or senator, that is, is to give you further entree. But if you don't, um, you know, just there is a list on, on um, the Virginia General Assembly website of all members and you can find, there's a link you can find your legislator um, and reach out on the bills that you care about. If you see something in one of our alerts, um, emailing uh, um, or calling your delegate or center, especially if, again, if you're in that district, it's, your opinion will certainly count for more, um, is the way to get your uh, voice heard. Um, and let us know uh, what you're hearing. Um, and also, I just would like to stress uh, contacts outside of session. Um, during session, the legislators are incredibly harried. As I mentioned, over 2,100 bills filed this session. Um, it's a whole lot they've got to go through. So it's, it's always best, and you will always have a greater impact, even with your communications during session, if you try to meet with your legislator outside of session. And we are glad to help arrange some of those meetings, um, which we have done in the past. And um, so they're just a, a variety of techniques and you, you can come and testify in person on a particular bill. You can also do remote testimony. Um, given the pandemic, there's much more avenues for that. But just in terms of weighing in, um, no substitute for calling or emailing. And again, those out of session context. Great. Elizabeth, I would I would just amplify tri uh, Tripp's comments to say he mentioned the uh, virtual testimony. I, I've had great success with legislators in the time of COVID uh, with Zoom meetings, and I'd encourage you to explore those with your delegate and senator as well. I mean, a, a five minute Zoom um, is now today's um, in office meeting, and I think it's important to recognize we do have a part time legislature, meaning these folks are not. Um, all day, every day, sitting in their legislative office, uh, catching them by phone and, and Zoom is convenient for them and, and I think makes them more accessible. So explore that as well as, as Tripp mentioned in the, in the intercession period. Great, thank you. Um, there's a question that says data show that the positive impacts of historic preservation on neighborhoods, tourism, et cetera. How long do these impacts continue? What happens decades down the road when the communities may struggle to understand the ongoing benefits? And maybe that's for Donovan and for Julie. <laughs> well, I'll take the first shot. Um, I think that what's, what's really important and that needs to be at the kind of core of us as preservationists is to move from the concept of ownership to the concept of stewardship. It's not just the right of ownership, it's the obligation of stewardship that we have with historic buildings. And if we are good stewards, and if we, if we develop a, a community that understands that we're stewarding for the next generation, then it's, it's not an issue. Then the, 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 next, the next owner will also be a steward. So I think that that is just this mindset that we need to continue to work on to think about in terms of, of, of stewardship. Uh, the, you know, buildings actually don't have that many enemies. Uh, water, extreme change to temperature, and vandalism. And if you can mitigate those three, there's not a particularly short life to buildings. And so there's no inherent reason that they can't be, you know, productive assets in our communities uh, 50 and 100 and 150 years from now. Uh, we just need to make sure that we're stewarding them today so it's possible for somebody to steward them 20 years from now. Well, I completely agree with that. And stewardship is an ongoing uh, proposition. It doesn't end when you get your historic district listed or your tax credit project certified. And we all know that buildings require maintenance and we need to use all the tools that are available to us, including at the local level. And uh, many communities take the next step and 
designate local historic districts and design review and require affirmative maintenance and all of those things help protect the investment that may have been made 10 or 20 years ago, but is still benefit benefiting the community today. So uh, Elizabeth, can I jump back in that, that buildings, building components have different lives. I mean, the foundation might be 150 years, the electrical system 25, the carpet eight or whatever. But if you just kind of lump them all together, there's a kind of the average building life component. Let's say it's 30 years or 35 years or something in that regard. Now, sometimes when, when people talk about job creation from rehabilitation, a response will be, well, yeah, but once you rehabilitate that building, then those jobs are gone. And so it's really a temporary thing. It's not permanent. I'll turn that around and say, if a community committed to rehabilitate 3% of its buildings a year, and that would be sufficient then to that you would have perpetual employment in the construction trades forever of that ongoing maintenance. And it, 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 Julie's right. They need maintenance, but it's, it's not like a gazillion dollars every year. It's this ongoing regular process and it creates a permanent source of employment. Nothing else does that. Thank you. Um, I guess I'll pitch this back to Tripp and Hunter. Um, the question was, how does Preservation Virginia um, determine our legislative priorities each year? Um, well, it's kind of an iterative process. Sometimes we get ideas about bills that have come in or someone's seen from our members. Um, some of you on this call may have been once who brought things to our attention. Um, we also uh, honor our review all the bills as well. Um, but, but it really, a lot of it bu bubbles up often from partner groups and individuals. And then we filter that through, um, our, we have a policy committee on preservation of Virginia, which I chair, and it discusses um, and looks at uh, priorities for the session. Um, our executive board weighs in as well, as does Hunter, our, our full time, our lobbyist. And so through that combination of things, we make decisions about which issues we're gonna prioritize in a particular session. Thank you. Um, maybe we have one time for one more question. Um, the question is about um, the Virginia tax credit program and how can it be amended to help with smaller tax credit projects um, to make that sort of less prohibitive. Um, smaller projects often have cash flow problems and so how could we um, make changes to the, that program to help those kinds of tax credit programs? I suppose that's a question for me. Um, <laughs> I, would, I would encourage the person who has asked it to reach out to us directly if there is a project that they're concerned is too small to really be viable or that the requirements would be too onerous to make economic sense. We see all size of projects and including very small projects. And many of those small projects are completely managed by the property owner. They don't involve consultants. They may or may not involve an architect. So we have good examples of people who have successfully co completed small projects. Great. Well, I think we're coming to the close. Uh, Jenny has some closing words, but I just wanted to remind everybody about the um, Preservation Academy that'll be beginning March 9th. It's Wednesday evenings, four Wednesday evenings over five weeks. Um, we really hope that this will be, uh, we used to do some uh, in-person workshops around the state having to do about what it lives, what it, means to live in a historic district and they were well attended, but we think that by promoting these over Zoom, people from all over the state can attend um, at the same time. So we hope you'll look those up and then I'll turn this. I wanna thank everybody for uh, their presentations this evening. It's fascinating. I've got an armful of notes, um, but I'll throw it back to Thanks, Jenny. Elizabeth, and thank you to all of our speakers and to our attendees this, this evening. Um, I will just take one minute and go back to taxes, which is 
favorite topic of everyone's, right? Uh, that in Virginia, um, some jurisdictions do have tax abatement for uh, improvements to uh, properties, buildings, uh, including historic buildings, and that often can uh, result in a reduction in taxes for several years. Uh, and also uh, jurisdictions in Virginia have been uh, enabled to provide relief for aging property owners. Uh, so we do have some tools. We probably need more tools, and those are things that we might partner in the future with, uh, with others who are, are interested in, in making sure that people's homes remain affordable. Uh, both for owners and for renters. So I, did, I just diverted a little bit. Uh, former planning commissioner can't resist an opportunity to talk about local, local tools. But thanks again to everyone. And, and we've certainly seen tonight that preservation is good for tourism, that it's good business. Uh, we, we see Donovan has a backdrop from historic Roanoke right there. So many places we can, we can all take a day trip and have a lunch or stay overnight. Heritage tourism is so notable in a state like Virginia. And we've seen a resurgence of interest in history, all kinds of history, but especially trees and sites that are being redeveloped as those that Hunter mentioned that we hope will benefit from new bills this year. And that all of that will get people out visiting more historic sites and spending more dollars on food and lodging. And let your legislators know that you care about that. The data documents that preservation has truly been a catalyst and stimulus for our communities in Virginia.